Hello everyone and welcome to another Left Book Club event. Tonight we're so happy to have Matthew Brown in conversation with Sarah McKin McKinley. My name is Elif and I'm the Community and Partnerships Lead for the Left Book Club. Um, before I hand over to Sarah and Matthew to have this brilliant conversation, I just want to say a few words about who we are. So the Left Book Club is a subscription book club and not-for-profit initiative. We publish collectible editions of radical books which are uniquely available to members and posted out each month. We seek to foster a spirit of collective learning and political education. We, create, we aim to create spaces and avenues where people can learn from each other and discuss radical ideas that inform actions and practical steps with the goal of supporting the struggle fighting for us all. Left Book Club events have featured some phenomenal speakers. So after you watch this uh, brilliant conversation, feel free to check out our video library on YouTube for discussions engaging with a wide range of radical thought. And tonight, don't forget to ask your questions on the YouTube live stream chat. If you would like to become a member of the Left Book Club, please visit leftbookclub.com and click, become a uh, click join now. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Left Book Club to keep up to date with events, promotions, and giveaways. And right now, until midnight tonight, um, if you are a member, you can get 50% off any of our backlist books. We have a huge range of books we have published over the years. And all you have to do is log into your uh, member account and order it with your 50% off. Um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're watching us tonight. This hasn't actually happened before, but if the stream does go choppy, please stay with us and we'll make sure to continue running as soon as po possible. So tonight's conversation is about the book Paint Your Town Red. This important book tells the story of how one city in the north of England decided to level up without waiting for Whitehall. In the context of more than half a million workers on going on strike last month, a cost of living crisis and political decisions that have caused our public institutions to decade, decay for more than a decade, Matthew Brown and Sarah McKinley will discuss the importance of community wealth be building as a method for how local actions can meaningfully transfer, transfer economic, social and political power back to our communities. Over the last decade, Preston City Council and its partners have earned Preston the title of most improved city by generating and democratizing wealth at a local level. But beyond Preston, community wealth building is a significant and growing movement in the UK and across the world. Using analysis, interviews and case studies to examine, examine how a variety of local communities are applying similar principles to take control of their own circumstances, Paint Your Town Red gives us a blueprint for the wholesale transformation of our currently failing economic system. And to have this amazing conversation, we couldn't be happier to have Councillor Matthew Brown, who is the leader of Preston City Council in the north of England, where he has been widely credited as the driving force behind the Preston model, an econ economic strategy at the city and county level that presents a comprehensive interlinked approach to community wealth building as a practical and transformative alternative to austerity and disinvestment. First elected to represent the Talketh Ward in 2002, Councillor Matthew Brown subsequently took on portfolios that included community engagement and inclusion, social justice and policy initiatives, leading to his election in 2018 as council leader and to a position as an advisor to the Labour Party's Community Wealth Building Unit. Matthew is the co-author of the book um, that the discussion will be based on tonight, Paint Your Town Red, How Preston Took Back Control and Your Town Can Too. And Matthew will be in a conversation with Sarah McKinley, who we are so happy uh, to have join us tonight. Sarah is the director of community wealth, the community wealth building programs for the Democracy Collaborative. Sarah is building transatlantic partnerships to develop new community wealth building models 
and learning exchanges to advance a democratic economy in the U United Kingdom, continental Europe and the United States. Previously, she was a director of European programs and was the European representative for the Democracy Collaborative Next System project. She has managed the Learning Action Lab for Community Wealth Building, a multi-year initiative supported by the Northwest Area Foundation, assisting five organizations in Indian count Indian country to create social enterprises and employee owned companies. She supported the publication of an indigenous approach to community wealth building, a Lakota translation, and co-authored Cities Building Community Wealth, the Anchor Dashboard, aligning institutional practice to meet low-income community needs and raising student voice voices, student action for university community investment. Her background is in community development and has worked with community development organizations at different levels, including with the Greater Southwest Development Corporation, a Chicago-based community development corporation, and the National Alliance of Community Economic Development Associations in Washington, DC. While earning her master's degrees in urban and regional planning at Cornell University, Sarah was a co-author and coordinator of a People's Plan for New Orleans, a bottom-up community development plan for the ninth ward after Hurricane Katrina. She holds a bachelor's degree in urban history from the University of Chicago. I can only imagine just how rich and incredible tonight's conversation is going to be. So to, to kick that off, over to you, Matthew. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the very kind invite, Elif. Uh, really pleased to be involved in this conversation with Sarah. Um, yeah, I'll give you a bit of background about the book. I never, as a local politician, thought I would be writing a book. Obviously, the co-author is Rianne Jones. He's got a really good history of you know, writing about radical transformative economics and how we transform societies. So the reason why it was done was uh, several reasons. Firstly, at the council from about 2017, 18 onwards, we were getting lots of media attention. Um, people saw that we were doing things quite cutting edge and transformative, but there was lots of misreported of what we were doing. So I wanted to have the opportunity to really put uh, the Preston story, what we'd, achieve, what we'd achieved, what we we're going to achieve, but also the challenges we faced uh, into a book so we could actually really, you know, demystify a lot of the myths and a lot of the, uh, you know, hy hysteria that we get at the time around it and the misreporting as well, really, because this is often ve a very hard slog. So that was one of the first things that really sprung to mind. Secondly, it was really just trying to capture at the time what we're getting now, which is a really big increase and in advancement of the community wealth building movement. If you actually look at community wealth building as a concept, back in 2017, 2018, and a little before, it was really heard of in the UK. There's now dozens of regions, devolved governments, councils, institutions on community wealth building. And the trends are something that we've got to really look at. And I'll come on to why these trends are really important later, because these things are happening for a reason. People are looking at more uh, transformative solutions to you know, how our economy operates and who it operates for and who benefits, really. So that was a, another reason I wanted to write it. And finally, just to really make people aware in the book of economic alternatives, because these go back often uh, decades, if not centuries. So obviously, uh, people may be aware of the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation, which is a network of uh, over 100 worker cooperatives in Spain. And if you look at the public health outcomes in terms of life expectancy, mental health, income, it's really a model we should all look at. It's really common sense as well. The democracy we all have when we vote for uh, a councillor or a mayor or our MPs, it's really just saying that needs to be a lot more in the workplace and in our communities. And it's nothing that's actually that scary. It's very much common sense. And then other alternatives like, you know, the Lucas plan of the 1970s was a good example in the sense that Tony Benn was the uh, trade and industry secretary. And that was really just saying to people in the aerospace industry who are looking to go through a transition of what they were doing, that they should actually have a say in how the company operates what they do, the industrial democracy that they need to actually make it, uh, you know, a quite adult conversation about how we do economics and how we run businesses. Because I think the way we do it at this moment in time, it's actually pretty childish. It's pretty bullying the way we have our economy. 
and the culture that we have in the workplace, often in the public as well as the private sector. So it's trying to say to people that things can be done differently. And I think that's a real key to what I was trying to do and what, what Rianne was trying to do, just to educate people that, yes, even in this country, there are alternatives which, with a bit of support, can actually bring about economic transformation. Um, additionally, I just thought it was really important to look at what we've been through in the UK. And obviously, Sturry will speak about America and beyond, uh, often having it harder. But even in our country, we've had it really difficult. So... Obviously, I was born in the 70s, and obviously we had the Conservative government of Margaret Thatcher we did in 1979. And in Europe, that was the biggest imposition of neoliberal economics on our communities, which, you know, it, I think in some instances it doubled or tripled child poverty, you know, led to mass unemployment, deindustrialization. The whole culture of our society was changed by the imposition of neoliberal economics. Uh, that was pretty bad. And obviously some improvements for the less well off between 1997 and 2010, but not really a challenge to the uh, prevailing economic model, I would argue. And if that was bad enough, we then had the 2007 financial crisis. And from that, we had austerity, which my council was really you know, caught up in uh, quite significantly. And um, you know, we then had Brexit and uh, a hard Brexit as well. And since then, the pandemic, the worst public health crisis since uh, the Second World War. So my own view is people actually want change and they want transformative change because the levels of income inequality, you know, the, the disproportionate effect on certain minority groups and disabled people and women, it does require transformative change, really. And that is something that community wealth building can offer in terms of an architecture. I think also some of the political expressions we've seen that have been unexpected, like in Scotland, obviously, obviously I'm a Labour politician and I obviously encourage people to support Labour at all levels. But obviously the Labour Party, you know, lost a lot of support in 2014. Obviously Brexit itself, I voted to remain. It was quite a marginal decision, but I thought we needed to stay in there. But I understand why people in less well-off communities were actually wanting to, you know, rebel against what they saw as people that were holding them back, the European Union. So there was that. Obviously, the 2017 general election was unexpectedly good for a radical Labour Party. And then, obviously, Mark Drakeford in Wales, for example, he tends to outperform um, often with the form of Welsh socialism as there. And I think these expressions, some to the left and some to the right, are people responding to... Uh, the social and economic conditions that they they see. And I think locally and regionally with community wealth building, as well as potentially nationally, I think there's a lot we can really do, really. So that's what really inspired me to write the book with Rianne. Uh, but equally, obviously, it's really important to hear from Sir because obviously the work with the Democracy Collaborative, uh, you've got to remember the collaborative phrase, the term community wealth building about 20 years ago, and crucially, I'm really interested for you, Sir, about you know why you feel community wealth building is uh, gaining ground, but also the history of your work a little further and uh, the Democracy Collaborative and other partners in America and beyond and where we are with that. Thank you, Matthew. And, you know, it's always a pleasure to be in this space uh, with you um, and wonderful to be here with the Left Book Club, although I, I feel like I really need to rewrite my bio because that was a mouthful and, and a little bit embarrassing. So I'll work on that. But thank you for, for the warm welcome. But, but most of all, thank you, Matthew, for your work and for the work that's been done and is still being done in Preston. I think it is so important to see real life models of alternative economic uh, configurations and designs in, in place, in, in, in the real world, in our day-to-day -day life. Um, it's very, very difficult to uh, make uh, systemic change, make economic transformation while also living in the system we live in. And we have to do these things at the same time. And I, it's a real, it's it's not easy work. Um, it, and so I just, I want to credit Matthew. I want to credit the, the people in Preston, um, the council, the, the community leads, the institutional leaders and so forth, because it is, it's really hard work and it takes many hands um, and it's a lot of fits and starts. Arts and um, but it's really it's really valuable and important work. Um, as Matthew already alluded to, it's it's work standing on the shoulders 
of of histories of 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 social um, movements of liberatory movements all over the globe. And so, to just speak a little bit about the Democracy Collaborative and how we came to community wealth building as a frame for economic development, um, for shaping and rebuilding local economies. Um, the Democracy Collaborative is a, a research and action oriented think tank, um, advancing models of economic democracy in place. And why are we doing that? Because we truly believe that democracy cannot reside, as Matthew was saying, it cannot reside only in the political realm or in the social realm. We need to be able to have control over our own economic futures. Um, we need to be able to uh, make decisions and reap the benefits of our own economic um, uh, uh, autonomy and, and, and destiny. And so really, how can we talk about democratizing the economy, truly um, creating an economy that is not only beneficial to the people that ma make it up, but, but is actually controlled by and directed by and, and the benefits of which are returning directly to, to people and place in the places where we all live um, with, with the assets that we all um, uh, hold. Uh, so, of course, ec Democracy Collaborative comes at this from an from a economic democracy lens and how to democratize, truly democratize the economy. And community wealth building, of course, is the model for doing that, for democratizing um, the economy in place, using different strategies of, of ownership, um, broad-based ownership forms of assets in place. Of course, we all know here that ownership and control of capital and assets is what determines uh, not only wealth uh, wealth creation, wealth generation, but, but also what determines our, our political economic system. So really, thinking about ownership and control of assets um, and resources in place in the broadest terms and building new institutional forms of collectively owning and managing those assets in place. That is the root of community wealth building. And the idea is, we call it, we call it um, evolutionary reconstruction. The idea is to model in place through a community wealth building strategy, these different forms of, of economic ownership and the benefits that they create uh, for, for the people living in community as a model of a new political economic system and how the, that local model can demonstrate um, long-term change and the possibility for, for systemic transformation. Um, and, and just to say that, as Matthew already said, a lot of what goes into these models, um, these community wealth building approaches, these experiments in place are not necessarily new, right? They they are um, from generations of experimentation, of, of uh, movement building, of economic self-determination and liberation from across the globe, uh, um, everywhere from civil rights uh, movements in the U.S. and economic self-determination in Black communities in, in in the reconstruction um, period all the way up to the present, um, in the experiments of Ujamaa socialism and, and collective uh, living in, in Africa and Tanzania, in um, the cooperative movements that started in Rochdale and, and have really taken hold in the Basque region, like in Mondragon um, and in Emilia Romagna in Italy, and really seeing that that really benefits people, not only just in terms of economic benefits, but in terms of, of, of thriving and well-being and really um, living together in the community and collective. And so that is that is really at the heart of a community building strategy. That is, that's its lineage. Uh, um, that That's what it grows out of. But really connecting all these endeavors in an intentional way so that they can scale, so that it's not just a cooperative um, experiment over here or a community land trust over there, but that these things are interconnected and they have the policy um, resource and enabling infrastructure around them to truly displace the extractive economy, um, to truly offer an alternative um, in, 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 as we said, that evolutionary way to begin to disrupt and displace the negative um, behaviors of of our of our current system um, and and the negative externalities that it produces. So so that's the the background of it, and that's sort of where Matthew is really doing this hard work in Preston. Um, and I'd love to turn it back to you, Matthew. 
to really just learn how the work in Preston moved from just Preston and a real solution to a, a, an immediate challenge to really inspiring a greater movement across the UK. And what what did that look like? And, and how did that begin? And, and, and where is that going? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I think you've hit the nail on the head when you talk about the need to scale this up. And obviously, we're all working very hard to make that happen, because I think that's a really key thing. Yeah, I, if I just start with Preston, if I may, just in terms of what I faced as a, a politician, um, we've been in opposition and uh, we won a majority as a Labour group in 2011. Uh, I was in the executive with my quite radical views at the time. I was quite pleased to be, well, delighted to be given a position in the executive, to be honest, by the group. Um, but what we did face when we took control was uh, a kind of like triple whammy, really. We faced, obviously, the 2007-8 economic crash, which was affecting everything, to be honest. I think we, there was five houses built in that year, whereas pre in previous years, it had been something like five or 600 within the local authority area. Uh, we also faced uh, the abandonment of a, a big developer-led project. That's really key because the culture often of all councils, regardless of political persuasion, is that the way that you do economic development is you try to primarily prioritise inward investment. And that often is corporate-led, especially when it comes to how you regenerate city centres. So the, the story of Preston was quite significant in the sense we were working with two of the largest developers for over 10 years to facilitate what in today's money would be a £1.2 billion, pound, I think, development of the city centre. And that would have seen the semi-privatisation of assets. It would have arguably seen the exclusion of local companies. It would have seen wealth extraction, in my opinion. And that was abandoned in 2011, just after we took control and with the economic crash as well. Additionally, we faced austerity as well because the payback for the bailout of the financial system in the UK, which I think was equated to £20,000 support per family in the UK, was austerity. And that was, again, hit in the working class areas like Preston. Uh, so obviously we needed more money because we were less well off, but we were getting the biggest cuts really. So community wealth building, the Preston model, really came from uh, that reality. And what we decided to do is we decided with colleagues that we've got to be more resilient. And basically, if there is a rule book, it's not working for us. We need to uh, tear it up and write our own, really. So we, we introduced a number of policies, first real living, living wage employer and working across the community to get living wage in the, we re-established a credit union to deal with payday lenders. We worked with our anchor institutions to make sure a lot more was bought from locally based companies. Uh, that saw an extra 75 million spent within Preston at the end of a four year period in 2017, often with locally based construction companies. And later we got, um, the NHS involved as an anchor, as it has done in many places across the country. And during the pandemic, they bought masks for a Preston-based firm, creating 120 jobs. We got our public pension fund to invest in our community, uh, which is quite significant, up to 100 million as part of our city deal. We're regenerating now our city centre. We've done a lot of it, but we're, we'll be finishing it in finishing it in the next two or three years in local public ownership primarily. So we're building a cinema, we're building office space, we're regenerating a museum. Uh, and crucially, it's all going to be publicly owned uh, primarily uh, compared to the previous approach, which would have basically extracted wealth away. We've insourced services back and then, you know, we're looking at a really strong democratisation agenda. So we're working with partners to establish a regional cooperative bank, which is very exciting to take on the large banks. Uh, we've got seven new worker-owned firms established. That includes a cooperative education centre with the trade union movement. We've got a housing cooperative to support our travelling community. We've, we've helped establish or supported the first community land trust in central Lancashire. We're looking at municipally owned broadband as well. And they're just really practical things like working with our NHS, getting them to recruit in the... Uh, most deprived communities. So we've just had, I think, around 60 uh, mainly uh, females from minority backgrounds who've got jobs within the NHS and that the local NHS with a, a project we've done very recently. And that makes sure that they often get much higher uh, wages and better terms and conditions of the private sector. But crucially, what I found is that 
because we were, we were having these conversations in Preston and we had this policy agenda, the amount of people who approached us is now actually in the hundreds. So what the book does say is how there's equally inspiring areas and how community wealth building has really rippled through our communities. So some examples just really quickly, uh, North Ayrshire, the previous Labour leader was a guy called Joe Cullinaney, really nice chap, uh, quite radical as well. And they've done things like spent tens of millions of pounds uh, constructing municipally owned solar farms. They had the largest house building program of any local authority in Scotland, established new cooperative businesses, you know, getting their pension fund to divest as well and get firms to transition to worker ownership. But crucially, in terms of land and assets, just saying that all of the public sector land they have will not be sold off and be used for social purposes. Other examples are like uh, Welsh Labour, Mark Drakeford's Welsh Assembly. Uh, you know, they've... Uh, they support what's known as the foundational economy, similar uh, set of policies to buy locally and make sure a lot of the wealth creates social value and, and, and ripples of wealth into communities. But they've also got a publicly owned uh, railway company, they're creating a publicly owned energy company and even a publicly owned construction company. They also established a regional cooperative bank and they're looking at a more core law similar to what they have in Italy, which will encourage... Uh, Welsh working people to have an opportunity to actually convert the firms into worker owned or, empl or employee owned businesses. London Borough of Newham, uh, pursuing the municipalisation of private sector housing in London, the cost of housing is the biggest issue and the ownership of housing. And they're actively repurchasing right to buy properties and even empty properties in the private sector. And then in, there's insourcing revolutions in many places, most notably in, in Islington, where I think there's 340 million of activity insourced back into the, the local council, leading to 1,200 jobs paying the London living wage. And then also further up north in the northwest, like we are, there's um, Steve Rotherman, for example, that's using public owned land to establish community land trusts. And there's going to be a community land trust with 196 properties in Bootle. So what is consistently getting me quite interested and excited is the fact that none of this not much of this was happening 10 years ago and now it's in many places in my opinion it's not at the scale that's needed to really tackle a failed economic model and actually bring about that equality but we're getting some kind of conversation about what a, a new more democratic economy might look like really so that is what is really quite exciting so sir i'm just quite interested to hear from you again about i've given you some examples that were mainly in the book but obviously Democracy Collaborative, yourself and other colleagues are working internationally and how this movement is not just a UK-based movement. It's actually a, like started in an American movement, but it's spreading in many places, not just in America, but you know, other places in the UK, Europe and beyond. So we're really interested to hear how, you know, how how and where that's happening, how it is happening, and what you think uh, the importance of that is. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And, and just listening to you too, and talk, talking about even in the UK, the different examples um, and, and how, in fact, how varied they are, right? I think often um, people think, oh, well, Preston is the great model of community wealth building um, in, in the UK. And then the other model that people may know of is, is the Cleveland model in, in uh, the United States. And they think of community wealth building as being a post-industrial mid-sized city um, strategy. And in fact, that's, that is not true. This is a strategy that can work in any place rooted in the assets of that place based on the conditions. I mean, even just hearing you talk, for example, about Islington, uh, you know, Islington is not a part of the world where you think of, of low wealth and, and disinvestment and um, urban decline, right? This is a hot market, a growing and thriving community in London, right? And the issue there is not necessarily about wealth creation. There is plenty of wealth, but who is it benefiting? The issue there is equity. The issue there is ensuring that that is distributed in a way that is, is balanced and good for the people who live there um, and good for the community and, and and, and the planet. And so it's even from your examples, it's really just interesting to think about the different applications in the different contexts. And of course, 
we're seeing that in our work on community wealth building uh, uh, globally. You're seeing um, interest in, in community wealth building and experimentation in community wealth building in places from Chicago, Illinois, the third largest city in, in um, the United States really taking this on as, as an equity issue and specifically a racial equity issue, a, a racial justice issue, and really asking the question, how do we address deep systemic issues of racial inequality in the city of Chicago and how those have played out spatially and what that looks like within the city in terms of segregation and access and crime and all of these things. And how do we address this in a real way? And they asking that question, they came to, to the answer of community wealth building, that to truly address issues of racial inequality in the city of Chicago, they need to address economic inequalities and they need to do so at the roots. They need to look at how um, wealth is created and rooted and who it is benefiting um, and really asking those questions and then looking at how they can begin to change that narrative so that those structural inequalities that have existed in a place like Chicago do not perpetuate it themselves into this era of, 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 of compounding crisis, frankly, that we're in. So, so, you know, you're seeing that in a place like Chicago, and then you're seeing it also in a place like Meadville, Pennsylvania, which is, is a small um, rural area in Western Pennsylvania that used to have a fairly large tool and die manufacturing sector, a large agricultural sector. They've really um, suffered in not only the post-industrial um, period, but also in sort of agglomeration farming and what that's done to, to the farmers in that area. And really looking at what is their alternative when they really have suffered from extreme um, loss of resource uh, and, and, and loss of population and all of these things. And how do they reverse those trends and, and actually reclaim claim um, the, the value of their land, of, of um, their community, and so forth, and looking at things like community land trusts, looking at things like collective um, credit uh, unions and community investment vehicles and things of that nature. So, so those are just two very different examples in the United States, but you're also seeing this work, and, and Matthew already mentioned North Ayrshire in, in Scotland, but start to influence um, the Scottish government's approach to an integrated strategy, an integrated economic strategy um, for all of their local authorities, including places like, like the Highlands and the Islands, rural areas, thinking about you know, what does it look like for people living there to truly own and control their own economic assets. Um, so it, it's, it's a model that can be used and applied in all kinds of contexts. Finally, I just, uh, before I go back to Matthew, because I, I want to hear, you know, really what that looks like in this moment of crisis and where do we go from here? Uh, I want to dig into that, but just to say, we're also doing work in Northern Ireland. Matthew's been over there and, and, and um, uh, myself and some colleagues have been a part of an advisory panel to the uh, Northern Irish executive of course, that's not sitting at the moment, but but it's an ongoing effort um, to to think about community wealth building as a way to address not just their regional imbalances and inequalities, but but also as a way to to um, formalize uh, or to make real on the promise of peace and peace building. And what does it look like if people can really truly have economic self-determination? What does that mean for the peace process in a post-conflict environment um, in, in a place like Northern Ireland? And of course, that has ramifications for communities all over the world. And certainly, unfortunately, more and more so now that we're in a period of war um, and other things. And of course, uh, as an American, uh, We've, we've sort of been perpetuating war for, for decades. So this is something we really need to think about. What does it mean? What does economic self-determination and being able to control um, uh, and make decisions about those economic assets mean for, for peace building, mean for actually creating um, uh, coherence and nonviolence and things of that nature, not just as... as um, uh, treating a symptom, but as 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 really building the foundations for what we need for for um, a more sustainable in all term in all senses of that word um, uh, future. So, so and so so speaking of future, Matthew, I I'd love to dig in with you now. What 
what are the challenges in this moment? We're in this moment of poly crisis and how does community wealth building um, really address that and why do we need it? And, 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 and it's a hard thing to ask at a moment of crisis to be thinking both in terms of addressing the pain, but also changing um, the system so that this doesn't keep happening. What, what's the future of this work? What's the future of your work? And, and where can we go to really get to the scale that we need to make the change that we need? No, that's brilliant, sir. I think um, what really hit home with me around the future and why we need to do this was the pandemic and leading uh, the city of Preston and working with other colleagues in Lancashire and beyond and just seeing how you know, certain groups were more effective based upon income. So say the minority, ethnic minority communities, South Asian, African Caribbean community in Preston, you know, they were hit a lot harder as were disabled individuals. And, you know, the economic system as it is and government policies on top of that has led to certain groups being a lot poorer as well as the general gap between rich and poor more generally. So this is why I think we need an urgency. And my hope, probably naively, was that that pandemic was what all we went through and the amount of people who are sadly no longer with us or, or still being affected by grief or long COVID or whatever it is. I thought we'd it might be the catalyst for a new society. That's not going to happen with this government, but I think a lot of the self-organisation of the community spirit can actually lead to that. I just want to pop back just to briefly to one thing that you said about how what something that's happening locally really in, in influenced uh, the Scottish government in the sense that the SNP led administration in Stormont has obviously taken inspiration from what one council was doing and probably a slightly different example, but not completely dissimilar. I'm just thinking about how change doesn't always come from national politicians in Westminster. If you look at the national health service, for example, the, the actual structure of it, or a lot of the inspiration from it, came from um, uh, self-organisation through a cooperative structure, a mutual structure, in the late 19th century with trade union support in Wales. And that was one of the you know, founding principles and the founding structures of the NHS. So I think really importantly with community wealth building, that we can do this now and try to do it uh, as well as we can in communities, but potentially, as you say, much more powerful uh, governments, whether it's a old assembly or a national government, or maybe even you know a you know a trans transatlantic situation can really you know support it going forward. I think in the UK, just to answer your question a little more directly, um, I think what is very exciting is, for example, that uh, all the major trade unions affiliated to uh, the Labour Party back to the 2021 conference that is seen an expression where the Communication Workers Union are back in it as an industrial strategy who are actively looking at uh, obviously defending the members as well as they can do very successfully, I would add, but also how they can support alternative ownership models around, you know, worker-owned broadband, worker-owned post offices, and they're actively looking at trialing some of these at this moment in time. So getting national unions behind it's, re behind it's really significant. Um, Scottish TUC, they're supporting it as a policy. So again, that is a grassroots initiative that we do have that is significant and in terms of what's actually happening on the ground in terms of delivery you know we have the northwest mutual and uh obviously wales has bank cambria but there's other uh regional cooperative banks which are being incubated and being established to actually you know put democracy in the financial sector and put it in the hands of communities you know we have ownership hubs in greater london greater manchester and sheffield as well as a work in preston and beyond places like oxford have that we have land commissions. I mentioned what Steve's doing before, but there's other um, councils and areas doing land commissions. So that's looking at how we use land for public and community good, not not ensuring it's the hand, it's making sure it's not in the hands of extractive, um, you know, private sector organisations. It's actually in the hands of the community a lot more through economic democracy. But you've also got a cultural change in the NHS, even under a Tory government. So the NHS calls itself an anchor institution. And there's many areas that have anchor networks, probably most notably in Greater London, where it's not perfect and not as close as we'd like. But you do see a £73 billion spend of big institutions across Greater London, looking at where they procure and who they employ and how they could use that to move towards net zero by 2030. So, you know, so this potentially is the next big thing if we do get it right, but that's a big if. The big if is whether we can actually, you know, scale this up because what we're facing is an economic and 
political system, as people like Bernie Sanders say in America, that basically is often rigged towards the very richest. And if you look at the amount of billionaires that have increased the wealth, I think in the last 10 years, I think in the UK, it's gone from about 250 billion to about something like 600 billion, probably worse in America and other places. And that's what we're up against, really. But the fact we actually have these conversations about it's saying it's really important who owns the the wealth in local and regional economies and national economies i think that's where the hope is and i think we can do things now that potentially would influence the national government or even influence the president of the united states because i know that joe biden's touched on this slightly in terms of some of the work around federal government procurement so just back to you sir i'd just be quite interested in just hearing a little more about how this is working on the ground, especially around tackling things like racial injustice that you mentioned before and how potentially new fund is coming into it in America and beyond. I think, you know, five or six years ago, this was often very theoretical, but we're seeing real, you know, interventions and investment in community wealth building that's really significant. So I'd just be interested in hearing a little more about that. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And I, I do just want to pick up on sort of, you know, what you were really pointing to about the, the profiteering and how the rich have really gotten richer in, in this moment of of increasing crises, right? And, and that trend is, is, is um, you know, growing. And, and you're seeing that bifurcation between, you know, the billionaires and those, the asset owning classes and, and the rest, and the rest of us. Um, and, and, and it's, it's striking and it's, it's entirely unacceptable and entirely unsustainable on um, the levels of inequality that, that we're in and, and frankly have never really seen before. Um, so, you know, it, and I just want to make the point that I'm sure everyone here knows, but it's it, the system is not broken. This is not a sign of a broken system. This is the system operating as it was designed to operate, right? It is benefiting the people that it was designed to benefit. And so what we're talking about is, is changing that dynamic, right? So that we are creating a system that is designed in a way that benefits us collectively, that benefits the collective good. Um, uh, and in particular, to your point, Matthew, those who have been um, cut out of intentionally uh, from the, the the economic system as it is at the moment, right? So those marginalized communities, um, those those black, um, indigenous, and people of color communities across the globe that have not only been cut out of our economic system but have been exploited for the benefit of that system, right? Um, that who, whose whose bodies have been literally extracted in, in order to uh, hold up that system. So, so really, when we are talking about designing and building new systems in a new system in place, how can we do so in a way that rights those wrongs? That really looks at those the, the structural reasons um, behind um, uh, those inequalities, and how can we redress that? How can we, um, you know, look at uh, racialized inequalities in the United States, for example, and address them through um, looking at ownership? of assets. Of course, in the United States, um, former slave communities were denied access to land ownership. They were denied access to, to finance um, and the ability to access and and um, uh, control or or make de decisions around finance. They weren't allowed to bank. They weren't, um, uh, you know, in addition to being denied access to to jobs and labor. So there's a real there's a there's a real history there. And really using uh, this moment and using these kinds of local models to to right those wrongs, to redress those, to to really look at how um, uh, communities of color can own their own jobs, can own their own land, can um, own and make decisions about their own finances um, and and direct those in ways. And of course, there's a real history there. Um, there's a huge informal economy in in BIPOC communities in the United States and of course globally. And really looking at that and harnessing that power in, in a more more um, intentional and concrete and, and um, constructive way. And as you say, Matthew, using the resources that exist to support that. And, and certainly one example you're seeing in the United States um, is the American Reinvestment Plan money and, and a lot of the um, 
infrastructure investment going directly to cities, giving cities large resources and local governments large resources to be able to not only recover in this moment of crisis, but also um, be able to uh, use those resources as they see fit to, to um, booster and sustain um, an economy. And that, that is a real opportunity to to be able to uh, make decisions, to be able to look for what Matthew used the example of the NHS, those laboratories of democracy. What experiments are happening that we can lift up and scale and how can we use these resources to support that? And so there's a huge opportunity to do that and then have that really inspire the next wave of, of change as, as you're seeing, as you're seeing now, because we know that we can't continue to operate as business as usual. We know that we need to make change and we can, and those solutions are there and we just need the political will um, and, and the um, movement and empowerment of, of people like ourselves and communities across the globe to, to really propel that into the next phase. So I know we're, we're coming to time. I know we want to um, save uh, some space for, for questions. Um, and it looks like we, we do have at least one question um, uh, before we go to, to wrap up. Um, it, it's come in on the, on the chat. So let me just Look at that, um, Matthew, and, and see if we can address that. Inequalities in major economies like the UK and US is a real matter of course, and vast levels of wealth exist that wait to be redistributed. But much of that wealth is also created through extraction from other parts of the world, especially the global south. Does community wealth building have an anti-imperialist, anti-colonial perspective? Can community wealth building be compatible with reparations, for example? Um, I'll just start because I'm holding the mic, so I'm going to abuse that real quick and, and just simply say absolutely, absolutely. Community wealth building is um, an anti-imperialist, anti-colonial perspective. It is a local strategy, but it needs to be paired with solidaritist movements at, at larger scales, uh, regional, um, national, supranational, and we need to build up um, uh, that um, infrastructure. And absolutely, it can be paired with reparations. We need to have a redistribution around certain things in order to create the pre-distribution in a meaningful way for communities that have been um, extracted from and whose labor has has uh, and bodies have have really created the wealth um, that that the very few are hoarding and benefiting from. Matthew, what do you what do you think of this question? What uh, what examples might you add to that? I think it's a, a brilliant question. Obviously, we've had uh, quite a lot of interest in uh, from uh, the global south. I mean, there's lots of work being done currently around platform cooperatives to yeah, encourage that in uh, the less well-off countries, including the global south, to actually tackle some of the you know corporate exploitation you've had there. But obviously, sir, as you know, we've worked with Zito, who's uh, I can't remember how to pronounce his second name, I'm afraid, but he was the the MP from Tanzania. He was very interested in how we how he can uh, support community wealth building in his region because it was his position that a lot of the national banks in Tanzania were privatized based upon the condition of getting aid from the west so that was his position he expressed to us and he was very interested in supporting regional cooperative banks and also supporting worker ownership in a in that community so obviously yes i mean it can be employed internationally you know and i think obviously we do need to uh, make amend for the history we do have in terms of how we've uh, treated some other countries to be honest and obviously try to you know level them up for, for want of a better phrase as best as we can do to be honest so i think it does fit very well uh, with that i'm just thinking before we do finish sir just about you know what we both actually um think about a lot and we've not had difficulty speaking for 50 minutes haven't we we're quite used to that if it was down a local pub it'd be a lot longer no doubt but uh i'm just thinking about the real key about how we scale this up it's really really important isn't it because i think what we're seeing here is a real practical set of solutions to how we move to a new economic model how we can potentially move beyond capitalism itself uh, democratically and gradually over a couple of decades and how we actually scale it up my own feelings on that is that i think you know, working in communities, we are doing in Preston around community land trust, worker and employee ownership, 
uh, you know, other forms of, you know, economic activity, housing cooperatives, that's one way that we can do it, really, uh, really getting into communities and show them that, yes, they could potentially organise in a worker cooperative rather than having to work for, you know, a, a, you know, a gig economy corporation uh, they actually don't think that's an option and i think there's been lots of studies before that says you know when people are suffering economic um deprivation and uh, poverty that you know there's something that happens to the brain in the sense the actual options available to them is closed so they go more in a cycle of hopelessness and depression so in that context we need to try and say to people yes this can be done we can do it now and if unions for example get behind this as well as local and regional government we can start doing a lot of this now and it's happening already so i'm just interested about you know the need for scale and how we're going to do that potentially yeah it's you know and that is the the key question and that's the the moment that we're in is is how do we take some really excellent experimentation and a really excellent um, you know, uh, uh, showcases of the possible and and begin to have them move from the fringes to the mainstream. And that's that's where we need to be going right now. And, you know, I would and I know we're we're moving to close here. So I will say in closing that I really, you know, the old adage, you know, you, you have to sometimes use the master's tools to tear down the master's house. Right. We need to use all the tools at our disposal um and and use those tools powerfully that you know we need to it's about it's about claiming power and and using that power to make change so use the tools that you have and then also change them as you know community wealth building is a way of demonstrating that you can make change in real time while also changing the fundamental structures of a local economy so that you're also rewiring that local economy to to operate in a beneficial way for for people place and planet so we we need to be able to use the tools that we have and then change them at the same time and and then and, and that's what we're doing and that's what community wealth building doing and as we make those changes they will produce better outcomes and that will start to begin to get us to scale. We can actually go from there. So I'll end on that note. Matthew, do you have any, do you have any closing comments? And then I know we have to turn it back over. No, I'm, um, thank you very much for the invite and lovely to be debating with you, sir. It's been, it's been a pleasure. I just think we need to pay tribute to Rianne, who's obviously not here today. She obviously spent a lot of time writing the book with me and obviously the focus she had on Wales, which she's got a, a, a strong commitment to being a Welsh person herself. You know, that really does feature in the book and some great examples from Wales as well. So I think we need to say thanks to Rianne. Sadly, she can't be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew and Sarah. And yes, um, I just want to um, thank Rianne for um, putting this book together with you. And I know that our members really, really enjoyed it. This was such a rich conversation. I mean, and as you said, it could have very easily gone on for hours. And I think we would have all been very engaged and very interested, but and perhaps more to come. Let's see. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone who has been uh, watching this uh, discussion tonight. And well, thanks for anyone who is tuning in at a later time. <laughs> um, just as a few reminders, if you are a member, Left Book Club member, you can get 50% off any of our huge range of backlist books um, on if you lo log into your member area. The uh, the offer ends tonight at midnight so log in and order your books uh, before then if you want to um, also visit leftbookclub.com if you want to become a member uh, follow Left Book Club on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel while you have been watching tonight. Thank you very much and stay tuned for more events to come. Thank you. <laughs>